August the 18th, 2020, I had an opportunity to experience a first. It was the first time I would drop my three-year-old off at his first day of school. And I think that would have been an important first no matter the circumstances, but it just so happened to happen in the middle of a global pandemic. And I think my wife and I were so hyper-focused on trying to teach a toddler to wear a mask for six hours that we didn't even anticipate the stress that might come with him being handed out the door for the first time and mom and dad weren't going with him. It didn't hit me until we made the last turn in the drop-off line. And there's all these cars in front of us. And we didn't get that opportunity to go see the school in advance. We didn't get an opportunity to go visit with the teachers or let him experience the classroom. It was a hand out the door to a masked stranger he'd never met before, and we zip away. And as I said, in that moment, I wanted to be strong dad. I didn't want him to see what was actually happening underneath the surface until I looked at him when he looked up and noticed he was, it was about his time and his little lip started trembling. And he had a tear coming out of the left side of his eye. Mom was driving, I was in the back seat. And I've, I, I work in the emotional wellness and health space, you've heard about that, so I've had him on a feelings chart since he could speak his first word. <laughs> and you'll understand why in a moment, because I didn't get that kind of upbringing, but probably overcompensating a bit. <laughs> uh, but he looked right at me, and he spoke through his tears, and he said, Daddy, I'm scared. And I looked right back at him, and I took a breath, and I said, hey, buddy, you know what? It's okay. Do you know it's okay to be scared and brave at the same time? And he took a breath, and he looked right back at me, and he said, Daddy, would you be scared and brave with me? And then there were two of us crying. <laughs> And I share that because, well, first of all, have any of you experienced the feeling of being scared and brave over the last three years? <laughs> Today, five minutes ago? <laughs> In that moment, thankfully, training outpaced instinct. Because if you know my imprint, I grew up in a culture as a man where we didn't have we didn't put a lot of emphasis or priority on emotional literacy. As a matter of fact, we didn't have any. And I learned early on that when it comes to emotion, there are good ones and there are bad ones. You avoid the bad ones at all costs, and you chase the good ones like your life depends on it. Well, that was a setup for me at an early age because I think I came out of the womb in a sensitive and emotional guy. And I never got to see what that looked like until my life depended on it much later. What I did is it was kind of confusing, so I started to look externally for my worth and my value early on. But thankfully, that ushered me into this space. I'm a product of our work. I didn't get into it by accident. I had my own kind of face plant moment in life in my early 20s. Had an opportunity to have a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about in the next few minutes. And when the right people came around me at the right time, I had a lights coming on moment. And it was in that moment that I decided, not only has this changed my life, but I'm committed and determined to be a guide for as many people as I can as the time I have on earth to usher them into the same healing experience I got. But keep in mind, no matter how armed you might be with amazing tools and amazing information, and chances are you picked up a lot of that today, when you're in a high stress environment and you're sleep deprived, all the tools go right out the damn window. <laughs> Because I honestly, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an older first time dad. And I thought, and I've been working in the psychology space for two decades, if anybody's gonna crush the dad game, it's me. <laughs> I was like, I know how to do this, I got it. And boy, was I humbled in a hurry. And I'm still humbled every day because my son's five now and my daughter's three. But in that moment, thankfully, inst or training took over instinct because instinct told me don't show him weakness. Training told me, mirror what that little boy is trying to tell you. And I said the right thing, but I didn't feel the right thing. I said logically what I've been trained to say. It's okay to feel scared and brave at the same time. But it wasn't until he mirrored his experience back to me that I felt the right thing. And wouldn't you believe it, that when he saw me feeling what he felt, 
he didn't see weakness. He experienced strength. And his little shoulders raised up, and his eyes looked up at me, and he wiped his tears away, and he hopped right out of the car. That's a picture from that day that my wife snapped in the back seat. It was right after that moment, right before we handed him off. I have had the great honor of working in emotional health and developed a specialty in, in emotional and psychological trauma years ago, but it wasn't until probably 10 years into my career having run and started some different centers and across the spectrum of care from working with people who really needed it, who'd experienced a lot of dire circumstances and a significant amount of adversity, and all the way to the worried well, which is life's going pretty good, but I don't know a human being that hasn't experienced adversity because guess what? Nobody escapes it. And I know enough to know I'm talking to a, a, a theater full of people who work in the entertain or who work in the hospitality space. I work with entertainment a lot too. As you might imagine, we're kind of needed there. Um, <laughs> as I look out here, I know one in three people qualify for a service that I provide. I know that just statistically by what the data tells me. I know what one in three of you have experienced. But I need to tell you, experience has taught me that it's not one in three. It's every single person in this room. And it's not that you need what somebody like me has to offer. It's you deserve it. I changed that script a long time ago. And I'm a product of our work. And every year I lean into unpacking, resolving, and rewriting the narrative that doesn't belong to me anymore. So it clears the path for me to lean into not just who I am, but who I am becoming. And I make up that this room right here, because I served a, we served a lot of people that worked in your space over the last few years. And actually, I work in your space. I, feed, I run about 200,000 meals a year between the properties that we have in our company. I used to not look at myself as a hospitality guy until I got frustrated with the outcomes we were providing with all the sophisticated change techniques that we were trained in to try to help people's life get back on track. And I noticed there weren't a lot of people asking about well, what happens after they leave one of your programs or one of your workshops. And so when I started to ask that, I was a little discouraged by some of the feedback we got because we curated this emotionally, psychologically safe bubble. People came in, they got to say the unsaid, do what they probably haven't felt safe enough to have done before. They had this really wonderful experience and then they got slingshotted back out into the pace of life. And it can feel quite overwhelming. Anybody ever done counseling or coaching and left a session and it was like, whoa, you had this amazing aha and then your hair feels blown back by the time you get to your car? <laughs> when I started asking the important question, all the data pointed to the clinical model. Everything, all the smart people that I've been, up in, or I've been able to work around told me that we should be focusing on. But I decided to focus on something else. I decided to take the side stage of what we did, which is we feed people and we house people, and edge it up on the main stage. And it's not what we do to people, it's how we show up for people. And we started hyper-focusing on what you guys are good at. Surprise, surprise, our outcomes started to grow, and they started to get better, and they started to change. So I'm not a mental health guy, I'm just a hospitality guy. I just happen to host people going through different, difficult like circumstances, much like probably a lot of you have experienced, I know you have professionally. So just for a moment, we've got just a few minutes left, I'd like to ask that if you could, I know there's a lot of creative and amazing human doings in this room. I know you do amazing things. I've heard about some of you from fellow speakers. But what if we could take off our human doing hat for the next 15 minutes and put on our human being hat? Because what I've learned about what I do is it's not counseling and therapy and coaching. It's just human school. And when I learn how to become more humane to myself, when I do the work to become more humane to myself, I in turn get to be more humane to other people. And I think that recipe creates a better humanity. There's three important things that I'd love to leave you with to have a bit of a human experience as we, wound, as we start to land the plane today. And I guess, my guess is a lot of you have just been holding it together for the last several years without a playbook. We, I, I run live events too, we had to shut down for several months, so I know we've heard story after story <laughs> after story and testimony about how hard that was and how we were facing decisions we never thought we'd face and nobody knew what to do. I was one of those too. But I got to go in there and sit around with my executive team the first day and look at them and say, I'm scared and brave. And I think we can do this. And we pivoted and we did it. 
But there's three things I'd love to share with you about if I were to scale back everything I think I've learned about the human experience, everything I think I've learned about the study of the human mind, and say, what is it we actually do? Those of us that work in this, the change space of helping people become best versions of themselves and helping people offload the stress that we consume every day, what is it that we actually do? Well, we help people say the unsaid. But first, there's an understanding of self that has to come before we can sustainably serve other people. It's not a selfish thing. It's a wildly important thing. And it took me about 15 years of really getting curious about who I am and how do I impact the people around me and doing the hard work in order to free myself and sustainably connect to the people around me. Because just as your profession is quite heavy, mine's a bit taxing too. We consume people's stories all day long. There's a high rate of burnout. There's something called vicarious and secondary stress and trauma that, trauma that those of us that are in the service business know all too well whether you know it or not. So I wanna show you what this looks like just quickly and I'll need a volunteer. So is there anybody that would be willing to jump up here with me real quick? Probably take about one minute. There's somebody, come on up. Thank you. Actually, two of you raise your hand. Would you mind coming up as well? I'll use both of you. Thank you. What's your name? My name is John. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Perfect. I'll set that right here for now, but I appreciate it. Then we'll come back to it. Now I'm gonna have you come over and join me. Come on. Hey, what's your name? Michelle. Michelle, nice to meet you. Thanks nice for coming up. Nice I'll let you guys uh, hang up here with me for a minute, but I'm going to ask everybody to get involved in this. So if you would, just stand up quickly. Now, if you are, if you are able and open, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes. And unassisted, if you can, I see some people are leaning on the stage, so just if you, unassisted, and if you have a knee injury or something, take care of yourself. You don't have to participate in order to get the value. But if, if you can participate, if you're able, and if you're willing, eyes closed, and I'd like you to stand on one foot. <laughs> okay. Apologize to the back house for breaking the glasses. <laughs> okay, eyes open. What'd you notice? Just a couple. Wobbly. Wobbly. Yeah. What was that? Shaky. 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 Yeah, out of balance. Somebody said stressful. <laughs> anybody, anybody relate to life feeling a little bit like that? Sometimes, recently, today, all the time. Um, well, let me show you what kind of happens. Um, so I'm going to put myself in the role that I just invited you to be in. And as we know, life kind of feels like this a lot, especially over the last few years. But when life starts to feel like this, here's what we typically do. <laughs> Did you see what happened when I found this? What happened? Stability. Stability. Did you see my body take a deep breath? Went from feeling unstable to stable. I'm going to enroll you, if that's okay, as yeah. for me right now, it would be technology. Okay. This is where I go when I feel stressed, when I feel uncomfortable emotions, when I feel dysregulated. One of the first places I go is zoop. Anybody, I thank you for the head nods. I see some people relating. Um, every single one of us have a medicator that we don't know about when it comes to numbing stress and difficult emotions. Mine right now is technology, but over the years, it's been a lot of creative things. <laughs> Some I've had to stop. But I mean, in all kidding, <laughs> yeah, the hard way. Sounds like you know that too. This is a great audience. <laughs> but in all kidding aside, there's a lot, the, the statistics are through the roof around anxiety, around addiction, around loneliness, around strained relationships, around depression. So I know a lot of that's in this room, either with you or the people that you love back home, or the people that work for you or the people that you work for. I know it's in this room. And what we typically do when we feel dysregulated, our nervous system seeks something unconsciously that calms us down. Now that worked. Step forward with me a little bit. I'm going to ask you to come into the picture now if you'd stand right behind me. And I'd like for you, because unfortunately, even though we find this thing, life doesn't stop doing life. Life continues to do life. So you get to be life. 
And I'm going to find my thing back here, and I want you to try to knock me off balance, but you only get to use one finger. All right? So here we go. Reset the deck. Found my comfort. Do your thing. Oh, the, the first one, I was like, that's an aggressive finger. And then, the, <laughs> and then the second one was so gentle, you were like, uh, so as you can see, this is not sustainable. It is short-lived. But all of us have it. It's Netflix, it's Amazon, whatever it is, it distracts us from our presence, from a feeling, feeling the full array of emotion. And life doesn't stop doing life, so this is not sustainable. So typically we start here and ultimately... We're going to fall here. One of the things that I've seen is missing, and I think the biggest opportunity we've had in humankind for a long time, since humankind historically, if you go back in times where people went through great adversity, on the back side of that, now keep in mind, I get to see and witness thousands of people every year that think they're going through their worst, and I get to see what's on the other side of that. And although I'm as discouraged and stressed as you are about the polarity and the disconnection and the burnout and the exhaustion in our world right now, I'm excited about what's possible and where we may be going together. But today I just want to focus on this room and your industry because I think you do just as much to change the lives of people who are stressed and struggling than I ever will from, as a mental health professional. You give people the opportunity to walk into a space. And if you can curate psychological, psychological safety, then you will build trust. If you build trust even for an hour for somebody, you've regulated their nervous system, you've lowered their ambient stress, and you've nurtured them. That is hospitality, and that's what you guys did to do. And that's what I'm excited about. Let me show you one of the ways I think we could leave here with an actionable step that can make a difference. So, let's see. Um, I actually need one more person, and I like the look of you. Would you be able to come up? <laughs> I saw you earlier when I was standing side stage. I was so nervous, and I just looked at you, and I was like, I like that guy. I think <laughs> My wife is a, a performance, performance artist in her past career, and I was up, up there talking right before I stepped on stage, and I was getting a little comfort for some friends because I was quite nervous to follow all these amazing people. And, I, and they were, of course, giving me traditional advice. They were like, you got this. You know, got you. And my wife says, you know, somebody told me one time that if you get nervous, just pretend like you're holding a piece of ham in your butt. And I thought... <laughs> so as much as I thought that would calm me, it's completely distracted me, honey. That's all I can think about. <laughs> I don't even know what it means. Anyway, all right, so uh, Tim, come on up. I'll have you stand right in front of me. And then y'all come back into position. I'm going to have you do the same thing. So I'm going to feel stressed and a lot like a lot of us have felt over the last year. I'm going to reach out for something that may not be serving me. Life's going to give me a good jolt back there. Community. It's where healing happens. It's in this room. We get an opportunity that when life does life, we don't have to isolate like the norm tells us we should. We get to lean in to a Tim, and there's Tims in this room. As a matter of fact, the collective, what if we could leave here feeling like somebody's got our back as we move forward and catch other people's challenges and problems every day? Thank you all so much. I had you sit down a second too early, so I'm going to have you stand back up really quick. I want you to try this one more time. Stand on one foot, eyes open. What do you notice? To the ability that the brain can see itself, it can heal itself. It's called self-awareness. And I believe it's our superpower. Thank you. I'll sit down. I believe that we become better leaders, better friends, better followers, better spouses by becoming better human beings. And that's not a management class I ever got to take in my business training. I didn't have a school to go to to become a better human being. I got really fortunate that life dealt me a pretty tough hand. And through that experience, I stumbled my way through life and bounced off the guardrails in a season of life. But guess what? Many of you would have never known it because on paper, everything looked swimmingly well. But underneath, there was a part of me that was dying and my soul was starting to go dormant. Through the lens of me trying to redeem and recover my story and step back into the fullness of who I can tell you I know to be, I discovered a pretty simple recipe that's been really helpful for me as a leader. 
And it's not pursuing the latest leadership trend or the newest management philosophy. All that's good. It all has merit and value, and it creates a heck of a lot of problems that are outpacing the solution. Four to one. So how could we think about something differently? I think this is how. So the first thing I want you to think about as it relates to becoming a better version of who you are is doing the work to clear the medicator, and that can look like a lot of different things. We look at counseling as a place where you go when something's wrong with you. And it's actually what's right with you, that you would pursue a better version of yourself, regardless of what season you're in. You don't have to have problems to go sit with another trained professional and have a vulnerable conversation. And as a matter of fact, you don't have to go to counseling. You might need to, because it's specialized. I don't want to pick on my field. There's a lot of things we know that might really help you with complicated parts of your life. But at the end of the day, the principles of being vulnerable with another human being, like you've seen on this stage all day, if we can take that into our cultures, it changes things. But it starts by focusing on us. Second, understanding others. I can't really understand others and have an impact and have sustainable influence. I can have influence. But I can tell you 10 years into my career in the behavioral health space, I found myself working 18 hours a day, sleeping on the couch of the place that I was running, all in the name of helping people. And I wound up in the same boat that got me into this business in the first place, running through relationships, exhausted, tired, depressed, anxious. And it wasn't until I stepped back and really did some deep work on me, and by the way, that's not a check the box. It's like, oh yeah, I did my work. It's, a, it's one of those we get to continue on. I look, at, I look at emotional health, intelligence, I would define it as power, understanding, strength, and empathy around your mood and your feelings towards yourself and other people. But I don't call it emotional intelligence, I call it emotional fitness. Because I believe we need to treat our minds like we treat our bodies. And we're starting to do that more and more. And one of the ways we do this is to understand others. So just quickly, I'm going to have one more person come up. I've got to show you this, so you, maybe you'll remember it. Thank you, come on up. Why would I want to give you some visuals? Well, one, I'm very pro as it relates to change and in tapping into the part of the brain that holds stress and pain and not talking to the part of brain where you ration and reason this stuff away. If I say something to you, I activate a third of your brain. If we show it to you, we activate two thirds. If we make you kinesthetic and put it into action, we activate all of it. That's how you're locking people into an experience every time someone walks through the door of your establishment. And guess what? People get wounded and stressed in experience, and it's our job to curate experiences for people to heal. Hello. Uh, what's your name? Taryn. Taryn, nice to meet you. I'm Miles. So we're going to do something really quick, kind of an attunement exercise. And uh, I'm going to ask you to do a movement of any kind. You can do this, this, spin. You can do a dance, whatever you want to do. You can take a step this way. And whatever you do, I'm going to, I'm going to respond accordingly. So go ahead and do your thing. Okay, so how does, how does that feel? Fun. Fun. Yeah. You saw I stopped it before she got really complicated with it. Um, so when you say fun, you're, I noticed your body language shifted. From when you came up here, we were both nervous. And, and then suddenly your shoulders dropped. The smile got bigger. We started. So we, we connected. Let's try it one more time. So any of your moves. So how does that feel? Um, uh, like awkward. Awkward, yeah. Does anybody feel that way in your interpersonal relationships or the people that we lead? Sometimes we fall out of attunement, or our, our little ones will teach us this more than anything, is suddenly we're on our phone and they're, and did you notice what happened is initially you were, you were leading and then you couldn't get my attention so you started following me. You started attuning to my needs, just trying to get my attention. And it does feel awkward. And if we dropped a feeling or two below that, it would add stress to your system because you're in here trying to connect with another human being and we're just not aligned or attuned. Thank you so much. You did great. Hey, wait, 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 wait. One more time. Another move. Let's do like three more. Oh. 
awesome. I didn't want to leave you unattuned. So when it comes to others, I've got a lot to say about this and not enough time. We're getting ready to have to land the plane, but I can say that it's wildly important to do your own work so that you can fully attune to other people. And these are the people that we lead, the people that we love, the people we do interpersonal relationships. They don't need, us to, they don't need our advice. They don't need us to fix anything. They just want to be heard, seen, valued, and understood. And the way we do that sustainably is to clear the path for ourselves. So first, we focus on ourselves. Second, we focus on others so that we can see people as they are, because typically we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. Third, understanding us. Here's the beautiful thing about doing the work to offload the stress that we all consume. Taking a look at us. You know, as leaders, often it's hard for us to put down the microscope and pick up the mirror. And this is all about understanding you so that you can better understand others. And when you have those two things together, then you can actually have an impact on how you and others influence one another, a sustainable impact. About two months ago, I lost maybe my best friend in the world. She, I would have to say she, she, was, my, she was my best friend in the world. And I uh, had to make a really tough decision um, one that still haunts me a little bit, but I feel like it was the right thing to do. Uh, she's, uh, she was a little Australian uh, cattle dog, a little blue healer. And I had her for 15 years. I could put her in the palm of my hand, and I've never met another living being on this planet that was more attuned to me than her. She watched my every move. She followed me step by step for 13 years of my life. Every adverse experience, every joyous experience, she was with me. She was the best woman in my wedding. Serious. I dressed her in a little tux and she came down. <laughs> she, uh, she, was, she was amazing. And in, in two months after she's gone, uh, the last two years of her life, she lost her vision, lost her hearing, and she kind of lost the ability to go with me anywhere. But every time I walked in that door, she was on my heels and followed me room for room for the last two years of her life until her last breath. And now I find myself walking through our home. We've got hardwood floors just like this. And I can hear her little paw prints behind me. But I, I don't quite have the, um, I don't quite have the, uh, I'm not ready to turn around and face that she's not there yet. I know she's not there, but there's something comforting about feeling her and knowing and hearing her presence. Well, I love aesthetics. I think they're part of the, the hospitality bubble. I love aesthetics. I love when things look beautiful, and I love nature. All of our retreats are nature-oriented. So my house over the pandemic, I went crazy on aesthetics. I was obsessed with my yard. I started gardening again and just doing all kinds of stuff like a lot of us did. We didn't know what the hell's heck to do. And I, I invested, I doubled my budget of a landscaping uh, in uh, play. I shouldn't have done that, but I, <laughs> you know, yeah, stress. It's like, um, so I irrigated my yard, amazing landscaping. It looked, it put sod on the whole thing. It looked better than it ever looked. I was so proud of it. And I spent too much money on it, but I would just walk out my front door every morning and go, this is amazing. Until about seven days into my new yard, and my little girl, Dakota, she went out and peed every morning in the most prominent spot in my new yard. <laughs> right out the front door, across the sidewalk, and she peed right here. And it was the spot you couldn't miss. And she killed the yard. And then she killed another section of the yard, another section of the yard. And before you know it, I had a seven by seven hole in the front of my yard that looked terrible. And uh, it created this friction in our relationship over the last year. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm obsessed with animals. My wife was like, are you weird? Who am I marrying? Um, I, um, <laughs> it created this friction in our relationship. And it was quite contentious all the way up until really a week before she, she died. And I gave her a little grace that week. Um, <laughs> But every day, I was trying to get her not to pee there. She was blind and deaf, and she peed in the most logical spot for her, just like I do. <laughs> not in the yard. Well, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> uh, but in the mulch, not in the yard. No, I, I try. Uh, 
And I tried so hard to get her to, 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 to pee in the mulch. I would grab her by the collar and I'd try to pull her over and I'd say, Dakota. And every day we'd start out, we'd walk out at 6 o'clock in the morning and she'd pee in the spot and say, Dakota, quit peeing there. And, um, and now we're two months after and every morning I walk out my front yard and I go stand in that circle. In what was the biggest eyesore and one of the biggest frustration points about the sanctuary in which I call home now has become the most beautiful part of my property. It shifted my whole perception when I didn't have it, her anymore. And as it's starting to grow back slow by slow, slowly by slowly, I'm on Amazon looking for Roundup. <laughs> because you know what it reminded me of? You know what it reminds me of every day when I step into that, what used to be an eyesore and now it's turned so beautiful to me is her memory. And it made me think, what about the part of my toddlers that drive me nuts? What about the part of my lovely wife that drives me nuts? What about the part of nothing, honey, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, what about the people we lead? What about the businesses we serve? What about all the parts of our PL, everything that is stressful and hard to look at, and we endure it every day? When we work on us, when we work on ourselves, and we get curious enough to get empathetic with others, and we come together as an us, it shifts our perspective on one another. And I don't start sizing you up by what you do or what you agree with that I don't agree with. We get back to some civil discourse. We bring the soul back into being human. Growth happens in community. There's my girl. And I believe becoming a better human being is not what any of us need. It's what every single one of us deserves. It's not what's wrong with you. It's what's right with you. And when we take care of ourselves, we better take care of others. And when we take care of others, we can better come together as us. And when we do that, we get to live, love, and lead the way that we want to in a more connected and a more sustainable way. Don't let, this, this business is amazing. I, I, I adore hospitality. I'm, when I got invited to do this, I didn't really know what it was at first. And then I looked it up and was like, this is awesome. I have been here for every talk. I've loved being in your presence because I love what you do. And I make up a lot of you do it better than I do, so I'm here to learn as much as you are. But I know you've been through a lot. And I walk with people that have been through a lot. Not to push and pull them where I think they need to go. Nobody wants that. Nobody needs it. Our job as people in the service industry is to let go of whatever agenda we may have, join people in their adversity and stress, and just shine a light on the next stage from pre-contemplation into action and support them to change. And we don't take anywhere we hadn't, we don't take anybody anywhere where we hadn't gone ourselves. So if there's any part of you that's dealing with something really difficult today, and you're wondering what do I do with that, it may be serving as a block to you and your life and your leadership, your partner and your spouse, you may be on the edge in some area of your life, know that this day was for you. We came together to talk about a lot of amazing things, but we really came together because I know Will Gadara's heart and the people that are behind this conference to connect you, to ground you, and to let you breathe into the fullness of who I believe you are. So stand up as we close here one more time. Now I want you to, everybody look this way, just turn and face this way. And I'd like you to, if you'd be willing to, willing and open. You can pass on this if you'd rather not. But I'd like you to put your hand on the shoulders of the person in front of you. Now bring it back in for about five seconds. All right. When we walk out of here today, let's do something different. Let's stop finding out what's wrong with one another and what we don't agree with, and let's walk out more connected and have one another's back. That creates sustainability, and it makes this whole job we do a heck of a lot more fun. It was great to be with you guys. Thank you. Thank you.